Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 82 of the Showbound Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Raskin, here alongside Ethan Cardwell. Cards, training camp underway back in the OHL. How's it going, man? Yeah, it's good, man. First day of being a 20 bomb um, in the league. So uh, it, it was uh, it was, a, it was a fun day, though. It's obviously nice to get things going with the guys. Um, just kind of get back, get, get in the swing of things. And uh, the first day is always hard when you're trying to get your legs under you, but you know what, we, we battled through day one and it's on to day two now tomorrow. So quick recovery and uh, back to work. But uh, I know you got some big things on the go and uh, a big room nonetheless, as you just moved in today, right? Yeah, just moved into the new house. Um, I gave Cardsy a quick room tour before the podcast started, but we'll we'll save it. Maybe uh, maybe if we launch like a Patreon or like something and get some more money, they can get the room tour. But, yeah. Uh, um yeah spent the day moving today and yesterday um i love my house man it's sick i'm super happy here um great spot too and uh yeah we got a, today like our captain skate started for brock and the training camp started for the ice dogs um i'm kind of buzzing around both as we know now so things are a little hectic um i do want to say we have an awesome interview we'll 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 talk more about training camp in a set card but we i just want to say now like we have an unbelievable interview with zach dalpe uh captain of the charlotte checkers long time nhl are still playing he's heading into his 14th year pro a cool interview lots of insight and second half of the interview is just hilarious story after hilarious story after hilarious story like we were crying during this interview like i don't want to give too much away but cards what do you think of this man like we talk about it all the time and we're like there's it's tough right because like uh, we we always have like these young players who maybe like they're on the they're on the come up like they're they're um going through it they're trying to make it right and this is a guy who's been there for so long so he has so much experience and so many stories that it was absolutely incredible and he doesn't care to share them right like he he, lo- he was loving it and, and we were loving it too and uh he kept saying, wind him up and he'll talk all day. And I, and we were just like, yeah, man, just keep going. Like these stories are incredible. Like we we're loving them. So honestly, like that was like, like I just felt like I was just sitting back and just laughing the whole podcast and literally went so far off script just because the amount of stories that he had. And it was, it was awesome. And we were already talking about a part two because he says he could keep firing stories all day long. So I mean, I guess you guys can let us know what you think in the comments or in Insta DM or wherever you want to, but uh, just give us feedback and let us know what you think because we think it's an absolute banger. Yeah, I would love to hear from you guys about what you thought about this episode. And, um, you know, I've actually been texting with Zach the last couple of days too. And he's just... Like, beauty, eh? He's such a beauty. You guys can tell in the interview like how nice he is and how awesome of a guy. And it's no surprise why he's a captain in the AHL. But uh, that's that's exciting. Now let's let's hear a little bit about training camp cards, like what people want to hear. You know, how's it going? Actually, before wait, I even wait, wait, get... before you even, I'm cutting you off. It's your birthday today. Happy birthday, cards! Holy, <laughs> I get, yeah, you already wished me a happy birthday earlier, but yeah, I guess a we're, public we're happy birthday. Day. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate all the showbound listeners because I got a few uh, a few uh, people saying they, they love the pod and stuff. And actually, at camp today, a few of the young prospects came up to me and were like, yeah, I love the pod. I'm like, all right, sweet, man. Like, appreciate that. Like, that's awesome. That's super cool. Oh. Welcome to Barry. And, um, okay, crazy, craziest thing ever, actually. So I walk into the rink for our scrimmage this afternoon, and I go, I look in the crowd, and I'm looking up. And I see this guy and I'm like, I know that guy. So I'm trying to get up closer. I don't have my contacts in right now. So I'm looking and I'm like, that's weather. Jasper Weatherby no from, from one episode ago. Sure enough, Jasper Weatherby's there and he's with his spike ball partner or he's not with him, but he's there to watch his spike ball partner, his girlfriend's brother, um, who's trying out for Barry this year. So it was crazy. So I just got to talk to weather for a few minutes. In the How crowd. did he so not mention that on the podcast? I don't know, man. It was, it was, it was hilarious. I'm like, what? Like, what? Like weird coincidence. But, uh, I mean, show bounds follow other show bounds, I guess. Like, I guess that's kind of how it works, but, um, yeah, it was, it was wild to see him and then we'll see him in a few weeks as well back, back in San Jose. But 
Yeah, camp was good today, man. We had uh, we had fitness testing from like ten till one this morning, and then a scrimmage tonight. You had a so. sick picture in the fitness testing too. Yeah, I was I was fired up, man. I I love that stuff. It's like it's good competition. Like everybody wants to be the best, and you know you go in there with a work like you, you work all summer for that moment, like kind of just show like you've gotten stronger and you've gotten better. So it's uh it's always good fun in there with the boys. Yeah, uh, I mean. I've seen it go both ways this year with uh, some of our guys on Brock, some on Niagara. Like I'm not obviously going to say names, but some people you can tell who's put in the work. It's just yeah. that you can really tell. And I'm sure you can tell with teammates, like you can tell who's put in the work. Um, it's, it's an interesting time of year. I'm just looking above my computer here. I have my board of like, I got Badgers games and then ice dogs games down the other side. And I'm, I'm looking September 5th versus Windsor first ice dogs preseason game. That's in like this week, pretty much. Yeah, dude, like we have a preseason game this Saturday coming up. Like it's crazy. And I thought you were going to say the fact that you don't have any off days because that's going to be what it is going to be here for you soon. There's no, going to be no nights out for you anymore unless you're uh, willing to fight it the next day. But uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm uh, I'm committed to the game, man. I mean, it, it was like this last year for me, too. It was rare to get a night out. But I mean, I manage my time well, as we know, we're still always able to do these. I also look forward to it every week, man, especially like, dude, it's been so fun. The podcast lately, like it's always been fun, but we've just had some awesome guys on like these conversations with these. I was just, I was kind of like reflecting on it with my parents, like, cause it's so normal to us now. Cause we've been doing it so long. And I'll say this too, cause cards, you're around these guys all the time, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. And so like, for me to have the opportunity to just like sit and talk with these NHLers and stuff like that. And I'm just like, like, who am I to, to get that opportunity? So it's really, really fun, man. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, man. And it's like, like not many, like not many players who haven't played pro like myself, like I haven't played pro yet. Like you obviously, like you said, you don't, you don't interact with these guys all the time and stuff. Like how many guys like know these kind of like kind of stories and like get all this insight. So like, it, it is really cool. And like, I think we take it for granted now because of the names that we've had on this podcast. So, but I mean, like, and I, and that's why I think like, we're like, oh yeah, it's just another episode. And people are like, that episode was amazing. And we're like, we're just getting so used to the episodes. We're just like, oh yeah, like, I don't know. That's just what we do. <laughs> yeah. I'm never like, we, we can never take it for granted. And as I was unpacking uh, in my new room here, I take out the 50th episode trophy thing and I put it out on my shelf and I'm like, we're at 82 right now. We're almost at a hundred, man. I mean, I know it's a bit of a stretch still. We got 18 to go after this, but like, I don't know. It's and I, I'm, I was just like, what are we, what are we gonna get for a hundred, man? <laughs> yeah, bro. I actually, yes, yeah, so the same thing. Just moving in the other day, and I put it up. I'm just looking at it right now. It's on my mantle right beside my TV. So anytime I'm watching TV, I get a nice, beautiful view of the reminder of like how long we've been doing this and how like well this has been going. And people always come up to me. They're like, "How many episodes?" I'm like, "Ah, 70, 75, 80. They're like, "Holy, like that's a legit accomplishment in the podcasting world and stuff." So for us to be able to do that with very limited episodes of not having a guest, I think is awesome. And I think, I think not having a guest some weeks is, is the right call and like just catch up when we have a ton of stuff to talk about. And I think we'll keep rolling with that, but with the guests we've gotten, it's, it's been pretty good. And like, I'm, I'm just super happy. And I think this week's made us really reflect on that with like kind of the, the great stories that people are just about to hear. And I'm, I mean, like, I don't know, I don't really have much more. I mean, I, I know you got a nice read for us. Before we send it into the interview, we have a little message from Manscaped. Smooth sack summer is slowly coming to an end, fellas. If you haven't been scaping for the summer sun, it's not too late to sweep your sack of those pesky pubes. As summer comes to an end and we enter fall, keep your boys clean and fresh just in time for fresh ball fall. The leader in below the waist grooming is here to make sure your pubes feel smoother than a beach ball and smell fresher than your girl's pumpkin spice. Start the new season the right way and join over 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. Get 20% off and free shipping worldwide with the code SHOWBOUND at manscaped.com. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to keep your sweet, sweet sack in check. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a Travel Bag to hold your goodies. Their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer features a cutting-edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin-safe technology. 
The lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor, a new multifunction on-off switch that can engage a travel lock, and gives you the ability to turn the 4,000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. Did I mention this trimmer is waterproof too? Whether you're hopping in the shower or hitting up the lake, this razor will devour even the strongest pubes. Now that your sack is smooth, lather up with Manscaped's liquid formulations to get that fresh ball fall freshness. The Crop Preserver Ball deodorant to stay cool in the heat. Their soothing aloe vera formula is the best in the business for below the waist freshness and the clear drying formula keeps your sack looking and smelling good. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their performance package 4.0, the Manscaped boxers and the shed travel bag that'll bring your comfort to another level at home and on the go. Keep yourself groomed from head to toe with their Shears 2.0, a luxury nail grooming kit. This kit includes stainless steel nail cutters, tweezers, and grooming scissors. With the performance package, your balls will be ready to impress, but make sure you cover the rest with the Shears 2.0. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code SHOWBOUND at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code SHOWBOUND at manscaped.com. Keep things smooth and fresh as we say sign at a smooth ball summer and enter fresh ball fall. Thousand pounds ball. Now, little insight actually in my life. I just bought the the Shears 2.0 nail kit cards. So I'm going to get the, the nicest nails in the league soon. That's dialed, bro. You're, you're yeah. going to be looking good. All you, you don't even need a Manny Petty. You're, you're dialed on your own. Save save the money. Why well, go for a Petty when you get the Shears 2.0 ma- nail kit? Anyway, before I keep, <laughs> I was going to say, before I keep fumbling my words, the, those listening to, to that ad read might, uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm probably going to fix it up a little bit, but it reminded me, <laughs> take those marbles out of your mouth or ask <laughs> Yeah, wait, wait till they hear this, man. Wait till Mike. you guys hear this story, guys, and we'll send it over to Zach Dalpe now. Okay, we are pleased to be joined now by Zach Dalpe. Dalps, how's it going, man? Good, yeah, just in my bedroom. Thanks for having me. I've been listening to you guys for uh, quite some time. First time caller, long time listener. So thanks for having me. Yeah, actually, I want to all say for the listeners how we got him on. So I was just checking the notifications uh, on the Instagram as I do every now and then. And I see uh, Zach Dalpe liked our video or whatever. Uh, I was like, oh crap. So right away, I just messaged him, asking him to come yeah. on the pod. And here we are like a day later, maybe. Um, yeah. I happened so- to be on my phone too when you messaged me. I was like, what's going on here? So I I, um, I, uh, I listened to the Gabe, uh, Curtis Gabriel when I played with him in, in Iowa and Minnesota. So, But I've been listening to a lot of them over the years. So Yeah, we love that. Yeah. So uh yeah. So you got the kids ready for school tomorrow, right? You were telling us you got to keep it quiet. <laughs> yeah. So I got three kids, uh, five, three, and one, all boys. Um, and the five-year-old and the three-year-old are starting school tomorrow. Um, obviously, with the pandemic and stuff, they haven't been to a lot of schools lately, like meaning the past couple of years. So this is uh, new to mom and dad. Um <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I haven't cried a little bit. I'm a softy that way. Uh, I'm going to miss them. But uh, I think we're kind of excited for them to get the fuck out of the house too, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can only imagine, man, like with, with COVID and stuff and them always being around, like it, it could be a little hectic, especially with three of them, man. Are you are you planning on having any more or is three the limit? No, one? man, I'm trying to give a couple away. There's no way I'm having <laughs> another one. Uh, I mean, we wanted a boy or sorry, we wanted a girl and, you know, we got all boys and I think there's too many signs in the universe that point to me having all boys. So I'm not, I'm not rolling the dice anymore with that for sure. Okay. It's like, uh, it's like when you're at the blackjack table, you just keep chasing it and then, uh, you know, you're never getting what you want. So, I mean, you, you just continue to have girls or have boys at this point anyway. Right. So I, yeah, I come from boys, a family of all boys, three boys. So I think this is kind of like being paid back for me and all the the circus that it brings with having boys. So I'm happy though. Yeah. And uh, so you're in, you're in Charlotte now you're from Paris, Ontario. Can you just talk about like how, how your summer's been, how you're finding time to train and all that with all the craziness in the house. Like tell us, tell us how it's been. Yeah, it was quick. So we went to uh, we went two or three rounds in with and lost to Springfield in the, in the American league. So we didn't get home till, um, like J- June 10th. And then we had to leave last week, which was mid August. So we were only home for two months, um, which was quick, obviously with mom and dad with, I, I say mom and dad, I mean me and my, my wife, but we don't want to, we didn't want to come down here as soon as we did, but with the kids starting school early, we had to, but, um, you know, I, I, I have a base or I have a gym in the basement. Um, I train at eight 30 at night. Uh, it's when the kids go to bed. I skate about three or four times a week in London or in uh, Oakville. 
so I'm kind of both ways a bit on there. And uh, yeah, it's training till about 10, grab a sauna and then uh, float into bed and do it all over the next day. So yeah, it's busy. It is. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll get into like where you're at now and all that. We kind of take people back through your, their careers and stuff. And I want to go back to your NHL draft here, which you played in the BCHL for the Penticton V's, which is like a known awesome organization. So you played the one season for them and you won the championship that year. Uh, can you just take us through that year for you? Yeah, well, that was 2006, I think. So that was uh, 2007. I don't know when you guys were born, but that's got to be, uh, you guys had to have been young then. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was from being from Paris. No one ever really went out to the BCHL. Um, I played junior B in Stratford for the Culletons. Um, and then I had a full ride to Ohio state, but they didn't want me to go back to Stratford. They thought that wasn't going to be good for my development. So we flew out to Penticton, um, Fred Harbinson, who's still the coach there now got a hold of me. And, uh, yeah, I was a little bit weary because of the flight. I hadn't really been away from home. But uh, once I touched down, it was unbelievable. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been out west, but just seeing the mountains, being from Ontario, the concrete jungle that we have there, there's just rolling hills, right? So um, seeing the mountains and then uh, seeing what kind of hockey it was, you kind of get thrown into the fire right away. Your parents drop your shit and then they fly back home. And and back then, they I don't want to date myself, but they only could listen to me on the radio. So there was no you know, there was no games that were filmed or anything like that. So there's like, how'd you play? I, I didn't hear your name on the radio, you know, <laughs> and it's like, well, I, I think I played okay, but um, it was really good for my development. And obviously with, like you said, the draft, um, Kyle Turris went high the year before. So it kind of put that league on the map. And then uh, the scouts came following after that. Um, and obviously being an Ontario kid, they were wondering why I was out there. So and not, not a lot of scouts had seen me before because I was a tiny kid and uh, I kind of hit my growth spurt heading into that summer to BC. And yeah, the rest is history, I guess. I mean, we'll, we'll roll into your NHL draft here and you're a second round pick of the Carolina Hurricanes at the time. And tell us about your NHL draft day and like the moment you were picked and uh, how it all went down. Yeah, so I was lucky it was in Ottawa. So um, it was like six hours from my my hometown. So it was load the bus up. I think I had 35 people heading to Ottawa. And um, it was actually funny. I told this story the other day to my wife because I wasn't with her at the time. Um, I was ranked like 16th on Bob McKenzie's. You know how Bob McKenzie does that list or whatever. So I was being the cocky 16-year-old or 18-year-old that everybody is. I was like, I'm going in the first round. And then uh, that that first round happened. There was uh, 13 trades, which is one of the, the most that's ever happened in the wow. first round. And it reset everybody's board, right? Reset everybody's order. Um, so I remember my agent, who's this old guy out of Rochester, his name's Steve Bartlett. Um, he was old at the time. He's even older now. And uh, I didn't get picked in the first round, and I was pissed. Like, I stormed out of there. Um, and I remember, like, this – this agent my agent who still is my agent he like grabbed me when we got back to the hotel and he's like what's your problem and I was like what do you mean he's like you're mad because you didn't go you know one to 30 you know nobody even knew who the fuck you were last year you know like what like, he gave it to me sorry if I'm swearing but I should probably shouldn't swear no you're that. good okay <laughs> oh yeah let her fly okay well he he gave it to me um I was pissed I stormed out of there I didn't see my parents didn't see my buddies who showed up and, and spent the time to to walk, potentially watch me get drafted but anyways he like let me have it and then the next day I went pretty quick um and then obviously you just remember being there with your parents um you know, it's cliche, but you, you just, I always tell these kids now, like I skate with Shane Wright and I was telling him before the draft, like, this isn't just for you. Like, this is for your mom and dad. I know your mom and dad aren't going to play in the NHL, but they put on a lot of hours to get you to this point too. So like, you know, if you don't go first, don't, it's, it, it's their day too, you know? So I, I treated it as, as such. Um, I think I had enough wherewithal to know that my mom and dad really, we're proud that I was there and, and got drafted. And um, it was a memorable day. You talk about BC, my, my billets were next to my parents. Like that's how close I got to my billets in, in Penticton. So um, 2008 seemed like, it seems like forever ago, for sure. Just, just a few years ago, but uh, who's counting? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you have any, uh, any contact with Carolina headed up to the draft? And then um, 
like did you did you have a feeling it could be them or I guess you you were expecting first round right so it was a wild game at that point you know what super interesting story uh long story short so heading into the draft I actually was committed to Ohio State but Plymouth took me in the in the OHL draft I was like 18 going in with the 15 year olds being drafted so they wanted me to decommit from Ohio State and go to Plymouth now at the time Plymouth's owner owned Carolina so there was a bit of a thing there so then when Plymouth picked me up I had an idea that Carolina was going to draft me they drafted Zach Boychuk uh you probably know who that is he follows everybody back on Twitter I was gonna say he Uh, follows me like 900 (laughs) times on Twitter (laughs) the fucking donkey but um (laughs) good guy but uh so they picked him i think 14th overall um so i was like okay maybe i'm not going to carolina because obviously the owner drafted me to plymouth so then 45th came around and my dad's like there's not a chance you're not going here so and i ended up going there but they didn't they didn't convince me to decommit Mm -hmm. okay you you held strong and ended up going to ohio state and we'll touch on ohio state in a minute but uh, was there was there any like weird uh, questions or things you had to go through in the draft process with any GMs or any teams? Um, not that I can remember at the combine. Now I have a kind of a cool story. So obviously teams are interested in you after the combine, right? So one of the teams that was interested in me was Boston. Um, so they flew me in after the combine for like additional testing. And, uh, I remember it was at Harvard university and I walked in and, uh, you know, like a pimple face, 17, 18 year old kid, I see Zenato Chara on the pull up bar and I'm like, you know, like Zenato Chara, I'm like, the fuck is going on here? I don't know if it was like planned or he just happened to be doing pull ups at the Harvard university gym where they were giving me a tour and they wanted to fitness test me too. I think he did like. I don't know, nor- I want to say north of 26 pull-ups and I did like four, you know, or whatever the, like whatever the number was. And, <laughs> and actually funny story. So we go to the uh, Boston Celtics games that night. And I know you guys are younger, but I don't know if you remember when Paul Pierce got carried off the the court. I don't, yeah. So I, yeah. that was the game. That was the game I was at. And I'm sitting in uh, the box with Cam Neely and uh, who played sea bass in the movie Dumb and Dumber. And after the game, we snuck out of the box and we walked with the regular public to uh, to get out of the rink. And everyone was chanting, kick his ass, Seabass. And I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, I'm with Cam Neely, you know, and my dad was a big Bruins fan growing up. And then people are calling him Seabass. So uh, that was probably the best experience or the best story I have from that whole draft experience. It was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bit, <laughs> that's a good one. And, um, I mean, you mentioned the Plymouth thing. I'm just curious, was there any thought of going to play in the OHL at all? Or was it like for sure NCAA all the way? Um, there was a little bit of thought. I had like, uh, like I remember Tyler Sagan Facebook messaged me, which I thought was hilarious because he was playing on the team at the time. Um, and it was funny. I saw him years later in a bar and he's like, why didn't you come to us? Like he still was a bit, a bit bitter about it because I guess they went to Memorial Cup that year. But um I don't know. It was for me, I was like an undersized kid in Ohio state Um, showed, you know, they, they stuck their neck out and gave me a full ride and I'm a very loyal guy at heart. um, And I just wanted to be loyal to them. Um, I I will say that Carolina wasn't happy about the decision. Obviously Plymouth wasn't, but it was kind of a, it was either go there or go to Ohio state. That wasn't a great hockey program, be the first line center, you know, play against men uh not saying that you don't in the ohl but you're playing against like you know guys in their 20s and i needed to put some weight on and and learn how to play against men so you you weigh it out at the end of the day i i think i made the right decision for sure yeah so i mean you you spent two years at ohio state before you ended up signing and just tell us about your time there obviously like you get the opportunity to be the man at a school like that so how, how to go for you yeah i mean you're not really the man at ohio state because like hockey's the fourth sport you know, uh, yeah like, i'm like, a yeah. man on the team no man. i know i i know i know what you mean though you think you're the man uh <laughs> you know you go there it's football men's basketball women's basketball and then hockey I, I remember true. like i remember like telling like you think you're cool or you tell a girl like i'm on the hockey team they're like is that ice hockey they don't even know so uh <laughs> 
They're like, yeah, I have an ice. There's an ice hockey team here. I'm drafted. They're like, to what league? Like, they don't even fuck. They didn't even care. But um, <laughs> I just, uh, you know, like going. I don't know if you guys have ever been to a college football game, but it's like a religious experience. Um, just seeing like 105,000 people. I was there when Cam Newton stepped on the field for the first time, and like an 18 year old kid that he was, they're chanting his name. Like, I don't understand how you couldn't be cocky after that. You know. Um, it was, a, it was a very cool experience um, that I got to experience later on in life too. When I went back to Columbus, that's where Ohio state is. So it was cool to go back to the school there. Um, and I had, I had a lot of success. I was an all American. I was up for the Hobie one year and it was, it was, I, like I said, it saying that I didn't go to Plymouth was a mistake. It, it wasn't. I think I made the right choice. Um, maybe attended a few classes, uh, but yeah, I was no. there. Make no mistake. I was there to, to, to be a hockey player and um, get to the next level. So it's probably not something that uh, a guy wants to hear as far as attending school, but you know, I'm an Ontario kid that wanted to play in the NHL. So I wasn't going to the fucking history class if I didn't have to. You know? <laughs> so, so one, one question on that. I wanted to know, I was curious. So what was your major? Undecided. <laughs> you, didn't, you, you didn't have to declare a major till after your sophomore year. And I left. So um, still undecided. There you go. <laughs> That's hilarious. We because yeah. we the guy we had on last week, he he went to University of North Dakota. And he's like, yeah, like did my school, like kept up. So it's so funny to see the like the the other end of the stick here. You're like, yeah, whatever. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to say I'm like a like a jock or anything, but I just I was telling my actually I was telling my wife this today. Like, I it's not something that I would suggest you do, but like they had unbelievable facilities there at the time the skating treadmill was huge they had an underwater treadmill they had like all these resources like shooting galleries and everything i was like i'll i'll do like i'll do the work i'll go to my tutor classes and stuff but like i'm i'm trying to be a fucking hockey player here you know and and it was something that like me and my dad would talk about we wouldn't tell my mom you know like you obviously had to keep a certain gpa to uh to be eligible to stay eligible but i was like i was diving head first into cold tubs hot tubs and everything i just named so it's something that uh, i think worked out for me now i wouldn't suggest that to my son who wants to do it but it, it worked for me yeah and like that stuff like way way ahead of its time back then like you didn't like no one really had a treadmill they didn't have the underwater treadmills and all that and they obviously a school like that has so much money because there are other programs and stuff that you guys like reap the benefits of that obviously right yeah. And like, you know, I think the football facility, they have an indoor practice uh, football facility. You, you can, they like, if they're going somewhere and the weather says it's raining, they can actually make it rain in the building and they practice in the rain or they practice wow. it. like, it's fucking crazy. They had like $200 million into their practice dressing room. Like, and like that stuff, like you have a student key card an athlete key card, you can swipe into most of these places. And I'm like, you know, do I go to geography one-on-one or do I, like go roll out and get stretched by like some world-class chiropractor you know and, and it was a no-brainer to me but like i said I, I don't want somebody listening to this and being like well the fucking delpy kid did it so i'm gonna do it you know what i mean so it's just i'm just being honest with you and it was 15 years ago or 14 years ago so it's the statute of limitations has, has worn off a bit so yeah that that's yeah. absolutely unreal I, I love the i love the honesty in these answers and uh yeah. we'll, we'll keep it rolling into carolina where you spent the first three years of your pro career and with the hurricanes and in the minors in charlotte and obviously you're back there now and we'll get to that in a little bit but how were those first three years for you you played 15 nhl games that first year pro and scored three goals so how, how was the adjustment level for you going from college to uh to the nhl um, it was good. I, I mean, I, uh, so Paul Maurice was my coach, ironically enough, who's my coach now, and who will be the coach now in Florida. So, um, after all these years of still kicking around and still knocking at the door to be an NHL player. So hopefully he sees that here in a month or so, but, um, yeah, I just remember my first game was in Helsinki, Finland. So my parents didn't get to come. It was one of those NHL premier games and, uh, it was super cool. I came in with Jeff Skinner, who was a highly touted rookie at the time. Um, we lived together, uh, we lived together on the road, we lived together at, back home in, in Raleigh. Um, it was fun, man. Like Eric Stahl, like, uh, Cam Ward, like these guys have already won a Stanley cup at the time. And, um, yeah, just looking back at it, just these like cool names that I got to play with Thomas Caberlet, Sergey Samsonov, 
as like a young guy from Paris who just dreamed to play in the NHL. I'm like, I can't believe I'm actually doing this. And um, I made the team out of camp my rookie year, which was like something that maybe they didn't have me penciled in. And I just had a good camp and just kept making the rounds of cuts. And um, then you're kind of off from there and uh, you get thrown into the fire. I played on the line with Brandon Sutter um, and Chad LaRose. I remember one of my first games were like line matched up against Jerome McGinley. And I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do here? Like this Jerome, like you have so much respect for him. Um, it's like, you don't want to like hit him or something, <laughs> you know, like it's weird. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm a competitive guy. I have sandpaper in my game. I had it back then, but it was like, well, do I like face wash him after the whistle? Cause he's doing it to me. It's Jerome McGinley. I like him. You know, I, I don't know it's, it, if that makes any sense. I don't yeah. know, but um, you're almost like so starstruck. I remember like Eric Stahl was like, did you see me on the two on one? And I was like, uh, this was in practice. I was like, no, I didn't. And and then I thought about it for like, I've thought about that two on one for like two weeks. I'm like, I'm just like, I didn't see him. I swear. You know, <laughs> and you, just, you, you know, like. I don't know. Yeah. It was it, looking back. I mean, it was 13 years ago, 14 years ago. It was just a surreal experience. And um, yeah, it's just my mind's racing thinking about it, but it was pretty cool for sure. I mean, you guys are younger and, and everyone wants to play in the NHL and, and hopefully we all get to do it. But the fact that you actually get to do it is you just pinch yourself and then you're thrown into a game. You're like, I don't have time to pinch myself. I got to fucking play, you know? So it was pretty cool. Yeah, I feel like there's so much, like, there's so much that goes into making the NHL. And then once you're there, you're like, holy shit. But you don't really have time, obviously, like you said. So that that's pretty yeah. crazy. And speaking of that, who was your first goal on and how was it scored? My first goal was on Johan, Johan Hedberg uh, in New Jer- uh, against New Jersey, January 1st, 2011. Oh, uh, I, remember, I, remember, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, Martin Brodeur started the game. We pumped three on him pretty quick, and then they pulled him. And then the first shot I took was on Johan Hedberg, and it went in. So I was one away from scoring on Martin Brodeur for my first goal. But um, <laughs> needless to say, I'll take it. Um, assisted by Jamie McBain, Tuomo Rutu. Uh, it was like a center pop guy. I went D down the wall to the guy underneath the goal line, Tuomo Rutu, and he one touched it to me. And I, and then if you watch the goal on YouTube, I hopped in the air like a little kid that does on the pond. Um, it's so funny because I don't, I don't remember doing it. And then after the game, like everyone wanted to talk to me about my celebration. I'm like, I, what are you talking about? And they're like, the, the, the hop you did, you know, and it, it is like one of those, I don't know. I just, just did it, you know? And I had no, you think about the goal that you're going to score and you have all these plans of what you're going to do after. And you don't know, you just roll with it. And uh, I still get made fun of today. Uh, these days, like my brothers make fun of me about the hop and, my kid will hop now and it's pretty funny. So, uh, yeah, I remember like it was an hour ago. It's pretty cool. That's unreal. I can only imagine about that, like the rush you score. So there's no doubt you might do something out yeah. of character, just random. Right. So Cardi, but, what would your first goal Sally be in the show? Man, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Right. But, uh, maybe I'll do the hop now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you want, if you watch the hop, like I hop pretty like I hop pretty high and then I and then I kind of like go back on my heels because I I, I got to land right but I'm so charged up about scoring it's I don't you can watch it it's hilarious I'm gonna pull it up later Rask you'll, yeah. you'll have to make this, make this a clip for all the uh, all the listeners so they can yeah. see it but that that's awesome but what was uh what was your like your favorite memory of playing in Carolina other than like sweet weather and stuff like that um you know what I, this is gonna sound weird but looking back on it like there wasn't like, I wasn't a young guy that like had to start in Toronto or Chicago or like one of these like massive markets, you know, like watching skin Skinner, like the year he had, he won the Calder that year. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't say there was not a lot of pressure on you, but you were kind of hidden a little bit as like, as a young guy in like a good way, you know, Mm -hmm. like I see the microscope that these guys are under and, um, you weren't under that microscope in Carolina and it's almost like it was a good thing to ease you into it. If that makes any sense, you know, um, you weren't expected. I mean, Jeff Skinner had an unbelievable year, but like 
you weren't expected to do like the Toronto and the Chicago's and like these, some of these, the beasts that these young guys have to face. So um, I kind of liked the market, you know, now, obviously now with Rod Brindamore there and like, they're an absolute wagon of a team and they're expected to win. And um, But at the time it was like, you were kind of like this undercover city that like, you know, nobody was having the rookie party in. Cause it's not a great, you know, lively city. And uh, so I kind of liked it looking back on it. Cause then I went to Vancouver and it was the opposite. And I was like, Oh fuck, you know, like what, this is way different. Yeah. So that's, that was, I don't know if it was my favorite memory, but it was one of my favorite things to start there for sure. Yeah, no doubt. And you move on to Vancouver, like you said. Uh, so going to polar opposites like that, what's it like playing in a Canadian city and like under the microscope like that in a market that that's as crazy about hockey as they are? Yeah. So I grew up a Canucks fan, uh, ironically. I mean, I'm from Toronto, the Toronto area, but I was a massive Pavel Burry, um, Trevor Linden fan. They had the old Bauer Supreme wood blades. Trevor Linden uh, is like kind of a, kind of a stock like Sackick, if it makes any sense to you guys. But uh, I don't think you guys call him a P92 now or something like that, but um, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, but yeah, so going there, it was like, it was unbelievable. So I was a like a fourth line guy. I played, 55 games i think 55 or 60 games and um yeah like you go anywhere like you think you're the you get treated as such right like i understand that there's some swag that these kids have uh in these markets i get it um i wasn't a 40 goal scorer but i i had some swag playing there uh you were canuck you know it's and you got to play for the vancouver canucks i got to play with the sedines you know it was a super cool time torch was our coach so that was a, a beast of its own but um all in all i think about it every day it was it was super fun um the fact that i got to do it i still feel like i pinch myself and um like i said i think about it all the time yeah i mean you're kind of answering questions as you go that i have lined up but i mean <laughs> one of them i, I got to hear about torts and i know you had him again later but what was it like going into that room and you got john tortorella as your coach fucking terrifying uh especially especially if you're so i was a 23 or four year old kid that didn't have thick skin so like john tortorella is not the guy for you uh if that's the case um very very hard nosed um hard on his young guys if you turned over the puck he let you know not just that day but maybe fucking months leading uh following that um i definitely learned a lot of lessons there about how to be a pro how to handle a guy like that um spent a lot of time on the phone with my dad hashing shit out <laughs> and uh it was interesting that's for sure um it's funny after when he left and i left i was like i'm never fucking playing for that guy again like like good luck getting a job like it was a, it was it was a messy year and then i had him again in columbus we can talk about it later but I like loved playing for him. So I realized that it wasn't just him. It was like me. I had to do some growing and maybe he had to do some let, letting off the gas pedal a little bit, so to speak. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I lived like in Vancouver as a 23 year old kid that didn't have thick skin, pretty sensitive, like we all can be. And, and it was uh, a, a rough year for sure for the confidence. Yeah. And, uh, and towards his back coaching in the NHL this year, I just want to remind everybody Philadelphia flyers. So keep an eye out on the post-game pressers, but, um, <laughs> you, you talk about the Sedins, you played with the Sedins, Ryan Kessler, Zach Cassian, Kevin BX, Roberto Luongo, like so many names, that, like household names on a team like that. So, so what was it like being in a room with those guys and like learning from them and being around them every day? It was cool. Like I got, so I scored a goal assisted by both Sedins, um, I'm taking that to my grave, you know, it's, uh, and it's funny on the retirement night, years later, sports center did a top 10 worst players to score a goal assisted by both Sedins. And I was number seven. <laughs> so, oh, uh, no. yeah, so I, Oh yeah. And I think my dad was so fucking mad. He's like, I'm like, who cares Dad? I scored a goal and both yeah. assisted by both Sedins. Who cares? Do you know like, who I number one was? Do you remember? I don't want to miss. I don't want to speak out of turn. It was like, Darcy Hordacek or so, somebody like okay. a, like a fighter or something. I don't know, like Tom Sestito, maybe. I don't know. It was one of like it was, yeah. but I was number seven and my dad was rattled. But uh, <laughs> no, it was cool. Like 
you think like the way like Alexander Burroughs plays, you're like, this guy's going to be a dickhead in the room. Unbelievable guy. Um, Bieksa, unbelievable guy. Roberto Luongo, who I'm with now in Florida, his brothers are our uh, goalie coach here in Charlotte. Amazing guy. And the list goes on. Like it sucks that they didn't have uh, a ton of success there as a group. Obviously the whole game seven and against Boston thing with the ride and stuff happened, but like the Sedins were, I, they needed to win a cup. Like they deserved to win a cup. Um, they're like salt to the earth guys. And I, and years later, like I, I needed a couple of jerseys signed for him and it wasn't there's from them and it wasn't anything to do with like son. I just wanted them for myself. And I sent the PR guy a note and then like two Sedin jerseys showed up in the mail signed to me. Like they didn't have to do stuff like that. I, I wasn't, you know, I played on their line for seven periods maybe, mm-hmm. but, but they did it, you know? And that for me as like an older guy now, it speaks volumes of their character. You know, it's like, they definitely made me a better player. And it, like, I got to see what they were like and how they operated and it made me a, like a better person. I honestly think now, I try to implement some of the stuff that they do. They did back in the day into me being like the older captain guy now on my team. So um, I owe a lot to them for my development, even though it was just one year. Yeah, that that's pretty cool. And that's like always great stuff to hear about and stuff like that. But I mean, seven periods, one talk, that means you would have been a 40 goal scorer if Torts would have seen it out. So <laughs> cool. yeah, so it's a, you want to hear a funny Torts story. So, that we're playing uh so i don't I can't remember who we're playing but like no one's worked with the sedines like it was like Ma- mike santarelli chris higgins yannick hansen like all these guys that just not everybody had great years that year he wanted the sedines to block shots and they didn't want to and you know like the whole torts hard-nosed player he loved ryan kessler mainly because he was american but um so so like he's going out we're like in the middle of a game and like I never played I think my average ice time in 55 games was 405 if you can believe that so I never fucking played and I just got the front row seats to the best game on earth but he's like looking up and down the bench and he's like Danny Hank and like he pauses and he says Delps and I'm like he didn't just say me and he's like you're going and I was like with Danny and Hank, like the fuck are you talking about? I haven't played since like the first period, first TV timeout. Like this is like, we're like in the second period now. And so he throws me on their line and man, I'm telling you like instant confidence. Like I thought I, I've turned into a good player in my mind. Like I was making plays and I remember like Danny or Hank, one of them was like, dude, like, don't be nervous. Don't think you got to get us the puck. We're going to do our cycle game. We're going to get our cookies on the power play. Like, don't think you have to get us, um, the puck all the time like we're gonna have it you know so um (laughs) yeah so like the first period i had an assist uh on one of their goals which was which was cool we're playing st louis um and i think i only had like a couple like maybe three or four points up till that point in like 30 games you know so i mean as as a guy that doesn't get points you got an apple in the first period with the sedines and in the second period i scored a goal so now i got a goal and assist and uh, I like called my dad after the game. I'm like, you know, we're like virtual high five and like, I'm going to sign a fucking eight year deal. Like this is unbelievable. <laughs> so then we're in LA the next night and I'm like doing a dynamic warm up and towards comes down the hallway. He's like, good game. I'm like, thanks. He's like, I'm going to put you then ag- again tonight. And I'm like, sounds good to me. And he's like, but you have the shortest fucking leash ever. He's like, if you make one turnover, you're done. And I'm like, and, and looking back, I'm like, why, why would you say that? Like, I'm just trying, now I'm gripping my stick too tight. You know, like I'm, I played freely and now I'm trying to play freely and, and now I can't make one fucking bad play, you know? So like, I think in the third period I tried to, I came over the blue line. I, I was on my forehand, I'm a righty. And I tried to like go to the one hand to, to shift over my weight and I lost the puck and they came down the other end and that was it. And so it was like six and a half, seven periods and that was it. And I just remember going from such a high and then calling my dad after that game and being like, you know, talking me off the ledge when I just told him <laughs> we were going to sign an eight year deal. So, um, quite the roller coaster of emotions for sure. Jesus, That's wild. Yeah. And then after your time in Vancouver, uh, you move on to Buffalo and spend some time there and with Rochester kind of split the season between the two. And what, uh, what did you get out of that season and how'd you find it there? Um, I loved, I loved playing in Rochester, Buffalo. Uh, they openly came out and said they were trying to tank and get McDavid. 
So it was like, I don't know, it was a weird year. I, I, I didn't play. I had a couple of concussions in the minors and then I uh, went up in January and then I didn't go back to Roch, but it was, I remember the GM was, I think, Tim Murray and he came out and he was like, yeah, we're, you know, team tank is what they called us. So um, we had Ted, Ted Nolan as our coach, uh, Brian Trache as our assistant coach, which was super cool, old school name. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we had a lot of fun off the ice, but uh, as far as the play on the ice is concerned, it, uh, it wasn't pretty. So I had a couple years there, like from Vancouver to Buffalo where um, I was a certain player, I thought in Charlotte and, and Carolina and then, you find, you know, your confidence, uh, I'm sure you guys can attest to the ebbs and flows of your confidence. My confidence went away for a couple of years. So, um, it was interesting, but I wouldn't say that I hated it. I mean, the Pagulas, the, the owners there, um, they're in the media a lot, but they treat you very well, very respectful people. They got a ton of money, so they throw a lot of resources at you, but, um, the on ice product that I witnessed wasn't great, but is the NHL nonetheless. Um, and it was fun. So I, I can't complain, but uh, not a lot of great on ice memories for sure. Yeah. And then how about just going from Vancouver as a city to Buffalo or Rochester? To, a little different, to, eh? To Buff Vegas. Yeah. You know what, though? The only <laughs> thing, uh, the only thing that I liked was it was like, I'm, you know, I was like an hour and a half from home. So I got to go home a lot. Um, I got to do like the fall time at home, which I hadn't done in years. Um, christmas and canadian thanksgiving stuff like that so that's actually i'm a, I'm a big homebody so that's something that I, I really enjoyed but yeah as far as the the only thing that's good in buffalo is the, the bars are open until four um Ooh. yeah so you can still kick or you step into fifth gear around two uh yeah and ride the wave so that was good yeah there's no slowing yeah. down in buff vegas no. then that's that's no. that's good good to know and good for all of our future uh, listeners growing up so find yourself in buffalo if you like to go out but um yeah. Minnesota, Minnesota, and then it's minnesota and iowa for you and you, you spent two years there but you didn't get a lot of games in those seasons was there injury trouble or what went on those years um yeah a couple things happened uh, i don't want to get too um, I don't want to bring the vibes down too much, but I, so I signed there and, my, uh, the first day of training camp, my mom passes away. So, you know, you're, you're in a new team, you don't know anybody. And then you have to tell the GM at the time was Chuck Fletcher. You have to tell him like, Hey, my mom just passed away. And like, I'm not fucking handling this very well. So, um, but they were great. Like he told me like, just go home, do your thing. So I, I went home for about two weeks um and then when i came back they were still in camp it was like the end of their exhibitions and they threw me in a game and i remember at the time i was like you know i i went home for two weeks didn't bring my bag like you know your my mom passed away so i wasn't thinking about hockey and uh i remember i got i flew to columbus to play an exhibition game uh for the wild and they threw me into a game and i tore my labrum in my hip so um i needed surgery and it was going to be like six, seven month recovery. And I just got to a new team, you know, the year before I played like shit in Buffalo. So I'm like, I need to like figure this out, but my hip's bad. Um, and you know what, like uh, Chuck Fletcher, um, he told me, he's like, get your hip done, go home, be with your family, do all your rehab, rehab at home. And I'll sign you to the same deal for next year, no matter what. And to me, like that meant the world um, for various reasons, you know, like, dealing with the loss in the family, dealing with the hip stuff. Um, he didn't have to do that. You know, it's a business. He could tell you to kick rocks, but he didn't. And um, forever, forever grateful for that. So um, didn't get a lot of games in because the next year, once I got healthy, I had knee surgery. That was the start of uh, six knee surgeries in a row for me. Um, so it's been tough. But uh, as far as my time in Minnesota, like my kid was my first kid, Brooks, who's five now he was born uh in iowa you know uh a lot of cool memories um minnesota is kind of like they're kind of like the poor man's canadians you know like they talk the same they they love hockey um there's no tim hortons there but it's pretty much the same winners and me and my wife would love to uh i think when i retire we, we were we would seriously consider moving to minnesota so that's how cool it was the time we were there um 
but yeah, ho- hockey crazy. I don't know if Minnesota doesn't get enough love for how crazy people are about hockey. Um, I think you're seeing it more now with how many kids are coming out of the state, but if you're a wild player there, it's, it's wild, man. It's fucking pretty cool. So that's sweet. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, moving forward from there, you find a good home for yourself with Columbus and Cleveland. So back with torts again. Um, but <laughs> how was it playing for the blue jackets? Yeah, it was fun. I mean, it was in Columbus, which like I said there earlier in the interview it was, you know, Ohio state. Um, you're seeing the better parts of the city, not, not as a broke college kid, but as a, a guy that's, hopefully got some money in the bank at the time, but um, yeah, it was fun. I mean, it was a crazy, um, you know, rewind it to me getting picked up off waivers. My kid was born uh, on March 8th. Um, I'm sitting in the cold tub in Minnesota on March 4th. It's my first kid. Um, Bruce Brugero comes in and goes, I can't believe it, but you just got picked up off off waivers. He was like shocked (laughs) that another team wanted me. (laughs) So my wife said it, she's at an apartment in Iowa. It's our first kid. Um, I have to tell her that I'm, I just got picked up by Columbus and she's like, are you just going to leave me? And I was like, I can't guess, you know, like, you, and it was, like I said, it was my first kid. I wasn't going to miss it. Um, she's taking me. I remember I was going to the games uh, in Cleveland and then flying back uh, just in case the baby was born. And uh, this is a crazy I don't know, coincidence or spiritual for my mom, but uh, at the time, so she's driving me back to, uh, I'm just looking at her telling the story, but she's driving me back to the airport and she's like ready to pop. Like her, she's ready to go into labor. She hasn't yet, but I'm like crying because I don't want to go and I don't want to miss my my kid's uh, birthday or, you know, her giving birth to him. So she drops me off and then I get on the plane, perfect weather, a hailstorm comes. Like, like perfect weather in March, but a hailstorm in Iowa comes and the pilot gets on. He's like, we're going to have to deplane. So I get off the plane. I'm like, this is a sign. And all the flights were canceled. And she came and picked me up. I'm like, you're going into labor tonight. I fucking guarantee it. And then she did. (laughs) And, uh, so we had the kid the next day. It was unbelievable. Like the fact that that happens, you know? Um, so I got to be there for him and then, yeah, it was, it's been life in the fast lane ever since. Uh, but it was fun. Columbus was a good time. Um, Cleveland was like near and dear to my heart. I spent yeah four years there, had three kids within the organization, um, owned a house there, like, you know, spent a lot of time in the city. Uh, Cleveland's an undercover, really good city. It's like a blue collar town, but it's hippie too. Um, if you're into that vibe and which I am and it's, it was fun for sure. You, you became the captain of the Cleveland monsters. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. Had you ever worn a C ever before that? <laughs> Um, I was one of the co-captains at Ohio state my sophomore year. Okay. Um, and then obviously like, you know, the, the minor hockey stuff, but not, not in pro yet. I was the assistant captain in Iowa one year. Um, but no, it wasn't the captain by any, you know, on that scale for sure. Okay. That's so how that. was it? Like you, it's a lot of people don't know too. It's more than just wearing a C on, on the ice. There's a lot of things that you do as a captain, but how was it uh, being a captain in the AHL? Yeah, I mean, you you hit the the nail on the head there. There's so much behind the scenes that you you know, like it's it's like a I always say it's like a fine line with trying to be a leader um, and a disciplinary at the same time. Like especially now, like I have uh, I call them kids. Like I'm not 50, but I'm I'll be 33, and some of these kids are like 20. You know, I'm much, much older than them. Um, so I will, I will refer to them as kids, but I don't mean that they're immature or anything, but some of these kids that come to me, like it's different now. Like when I was a young guy, if you went to an older guy, he'd be like, fucking suck it up. You know, it's fucking hockey that you could be replaced tomorrow, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so, but now it's not like that. And now that I have kids, I wouldn't want someone to talk to my kid like that. And so I, I think it's, you wear the C on the ice, but you're, you know, you're, organizing team events you're that buffer between the coach and the players you're deciding on off days you're deciding what time bus times you're at you're deciding what meal times you're at you know there's a lot that goes into it and and then on top of it you're trying to be a hockey player yourself you're trying to lead the team and you're trying to be there for the guys that struggle you know because that's that's what this game is it's it's a struggle and whoever gets through the grind whoever embraces the grind is going to come out with a long career in my opinion so um there's a lot of hats you got to wear there's a lot of um 
different, you know, um, avenues you have to take, I'd say, but all in all, I've, I've actually come to really enjoy it. Um, I don't want to say that I need to run a room or I need to, uh, control the fucking playlists or anything like that, but I've, I've really embraced like being that guy that these guys come to because, um, you know, I'd be 14 years into a career, 13 or 14 years into a career this year. And I've, I've done it all. And, um, I'm still trying to get to the NHL like they are, you know, and, um, I'm not like that old guy that's fucking smoking a cigarette off the bus saying, I, I can't wait to be done, you know? So it's been, um, it's been an honor wearing the C and, and the fact that, uh, I wore it in Cleveland was, was something special for sure. And that's, that's, that's incredible to hear you kind of say that and like, actually like hear the sincerity in your voice when you talk about it like you mean it and you want to help these guys and stuff like that and it's actually funny because i got a text um from a buddy who played with you a little bit this year in uh in charlotte and his name's jake friend um, oh yeah so, so a good friend we trained together and he was like dude he was like the best captain i've ever had like such a great oh. guy with all the boys and stuff so i was really excited for this one yeah thanks yeah friend or uh <laughs> did he tell you about the Dan Bilesma story? So we, we've was, heard this you know, one on the podcast. I was, was going to wait to oh, ask, yeah. but I want, let's hear it from you. Like you're the captain. You can say whatever. You yeah. Want. I, I, I was right there. I was right there. So it was, <laughs> I mean, are you talking about what friendy said to Dan? That is that what he, is that what you're oh. asking? I, yeah, I want I want I want to hear about this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so wait, wait, but just before you say, I we heard on this podcast another story about Dan Bilesma with ripping his shirt off and putting his, the line up on his chest and stuff. That. Yeah, and he had the starting goalie on his on his ass cheeks. But like, so like Dan, I mean Dan Bilesma is like, I don't know how to say it because you see him as like I I knew him and I'm sure you guys did too as a Stanley Cup winning coach. Like, we've all been around NHL coaches and co like, you think he's gonna be like he, this like hard nose like serious guy, and he was the fucking opposite for the best reasons. Like the best reasons, like. Our guy, our head coach here now, Jordan Kinnear, he's a serious guy. Like he expects a lot of you. So having Dan there was like the opposite. It was it was just like a perfect match. And uh, Dan was like one of the, the best coaches I've ever had. Um, his insight on the power play alone for how many years I've played, I've never seen anything like it. I was learning stuff on the power play that I never thought I could learn, you know? And um, I'm sorry, my dog just came in here, but... Uh, yeah, so Frender, <laughs> yeah, and you know, Fred, like Fred, he's tough as shit, and he's a good oh, guy, yeah. and he's like funny, you know. And uh, so we were doing a drill at the end of practice where they do like a like a D forward split, but the centers were gonna go with the D and do like like middle pop breakout passes, right? And so Dan Biles was explaining the drill, and he fumbles over a couple words to the point where you know when you fumble, you have to kind of stop and collect your thoughts. So while he stopped and collected his thoughts, Frender goes, take the fucking marbles out of your mouth. Yeah. And so, so like, I just told you, Dan was like a very like funny, energetic guy, but he gave Frender this look and he wasn't joking. Like he stared through Frender's soul to the point where like I laughed, but I knew it was a serious thing. So I like put my head behind somebody else i'm like i don't want to see how this plays out and uh and dan goes what'd you say and friender doubles down <laughs> and so i said i said take the marbles out of your mouth and no. and i can't, yeah and and dan biles was said like i don't i don't i don't want to misquote him but like he was he said something like shut the fuck up or something like that and it got serious for a second and I was laughing yeah. and Frender, Frender thought it would be funny because of the way Dan's personality was, but it wasn't. I don't know if like maybe the power player was struggling at the time, but like it wasn't a good time to say it. <laughs> well, probably not too, because also at the same time, right, we're talking about Frender here. He's not like, he wasn't full time on the team. He was there like no. on all up too. So like yeah. that probably, like maybe if you said it, it might have been okay. <laughs> probably not because he said it, man, but that's so funny. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I love Frender. I mean, he's a nail gun, obviously. Um, you know, we'll fight anybody. He's a good player too. He's not just like a fighter, you know, he's like mm -hmm. your, he's like your modern day tough guy where you, they can play too. So, yeah. um, 
Yeah, great guy. I think I posted something at the end of the year on my Instagram, and like one of his comments was Marble Mouth or something. I instantly knew I what he was saw that. About. So it was hilarious. Yeah, oh, so that's man. what he's referring to. If you see, oh that, my yeah. god, that's... hey, Sam Brooks in that Insta post. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's um, so funny, man. And like, oh, Frandy's like the nicest guy ever, too. So like, he wouldn't like mean it in a harmful way or like trying to get out. No, he just but... mis- misread the room. <laughs> That's the worst time too with a coach at the call up too, but yeah. that's hilarious. And well, I want to ask you about like the sore story about Balsma. I, I mean, we're talking about him anyway, so let's get into it. But yeah. with Saran wrap on his face, can you tell yeah. us about this or like what what was he doing? I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what he's doing, but like it got a laugh out of us every time. And like he would he would saran wrap his face like with like the wrap you put on your ice bags, right? Like on your knee, like those big rolls. And then he would put his glasses back on. Right. And, but then the best part is he would come into the room and like, you know, before you give the lineup to a guy to read, you say like, all right, boys, like they're going to be fucking coming hard. Like you, you give like a minute or two minutes of like your game plan. So he would do that with his face saran wrapped, but like it would, he would be serious. He'd be like, come on, like, power play struggling like this fucking difference maker blah blah and like you're sitting there and you're like i don't know if i should laugh or i'm definitely not in the mood to like go play hockey because but but then again it was like a good buffer because our other coach he's great but he's he's definitely serious so um it was but yeah like one time he emptied two water bottles like he read the lineup and then emptied two water bottles all over his face and then wore that suit the whole game like he kept his suit (laughs) on oh my god man this guy's unreal he's unbelievable like every bad thing that you thought you've heard it was like it just wasn't that i I, like i gave him a hug at the end of the year i'm like thank you he's like you know he's like what are you thanking me for like that was so much fun you know and uh i was like i had so much fun i always come home and i would tell my wife like fuck you should have seen what dan did today like (laughs) you know like dude he so this is uh this is the second round of playoffs in our equipment. It's our assistant equipment manager. They're throwing a football around and all of a sudden Dan just tackles him. But like he tackles him to where this, the guy puts his arm down and his thumb goes the other way. Oh, no. our, this is our equip. This is our equipment manager. Okay. So like needs his hands for fucking sharpening skates and everything. We're in the second round of playoffs. His thumbs on Mars and his other, the rest of his hands on earth. So like, he needs surgery. He's like, he's ner- He's like upset. He's on the trainer's table. This is like the five thirty. the games at seven, <laughs> right? This is before the five thirty meeting. So we have the five thirty meeting and everyone's wondering how this kid's hand is. Dan's just sitting there right before the meeting starts. And this, this guy's like calling his mom. Like he's trying to get his insurance information. He just, he just looks at us and he just goes, it's just a good fucking hit like I don't, like he, he like he still wouldn't like own up to the fact that he like put this kid's thumb on a different planet it was oh. hilarious he just was like i don't know it's just a fucking good tackle i don't know what he wanted me to do like it was hilarious man this guy He's needs to get way more credit in the sports world like you never hear i've never heard until like uh, a few guys from your team and you now like I've never heard of Dan Balsma being like this lunatic coach who's like the biggest beauty in the world. Like I've never heard oh, of him. dude. He was the best. Man. He's a head coach he was, now too, isn't he? Yeah. For Coachella Valley. Like, I don't know if he still does that stuff now that he's a head coach, but I mean, I just think he, you talk about Friender not reading the room. I think he was really good at like reading the room. Like he got serious too. Like he took great pride in like our power play being good. So if our power play wasn't good, like he would, he would fucking give it to our, like us in our power play meetings. Like he was, he got serious, but like he was definitely more lighthearted than not. And I think it's what we needed. And I think he read the room early and was like, this is what we need. And uh, he just kept getting crazier, which was the shit was, yeah, it was the best. I hugged him. Like I said, he was, it was yeah. had so much fun. That's, That's incredible. incredible. Oh, yeah. those are great yeah. stories, man. Yeah. So, We'll we'll keep it moving. That that's unreal though. But I mean, I just want to talk about this upcoming season now. Um, with Florida camp on the way and stuff, you're still signed to an NHL contract, but you have the C in Charlotte. Have they told you anything about like where you're like have they told you you're gonna be in Charlotte or have they told you you have a chance of making Florida? Like what's that like? Um, well, I own a house here in Charlotte, my kids go to school, so um yeah, I mean if I make the team in Florida, it's gonna be hotel living. Um 
but I think they're well aware. I mean, I don't think I've told them. I'm, I'm really close with Bill Zito, the, the GM in Florida. I had him in, in, uh, in uh, Columbus. He was our GM for Char- uh, Cleveland. Sorry, there's a lot of C's to go around there, but yeah. So yeah. I'm close with I'm close with them. Take the marbles out of your mouth, they Delps. But <laughs> I'm uh, I'm close I'm close with him, um, and I I'm I know he's well aware that where I am in my career, I'll be 33 in November. Like part of me being a captain is I still want to show these these kids that you can be my age, not be a regular, but still kick the fucking door down to to want to be in the NHL. So um, I think the day that I stop thinking like that and start have, having that mindset, I'm going to retire because it's what makes me like tick as a hockey player. You know, the fact that I think I've played, uh, I've played 13 years and 11 of them I've gotten NHL games, right? Like it could easily have been along the way, like year six or seven or whatever, whatever knee surgery, like I could have been like, fuck this, I'm going to Europe, you know? And mm-hmm. um, I haven't, and I still want to play in the NHL. So I think that all factors into who I am as a player and how they know me as a player and as a person. Um, yeah. Do they have me penciled in for Charlotte? Sure. But um, I have a little storyline that I'd make up every year of how to, to get me motivated. And this year it's, well, I had Paul Maurice as a rookie and I think he thought I was a this immature kid. And now I got him 14 years later. I'm going to fucking show him that I'm not. And so you, you, you find these little storylines to motivate you and, um, that's the one I'm going with this year. And, and, you know, like I said, I, I, I own a place in Charlotte, so I, I I'm going to be here at some point. Um, but, I, but again, I, I want to play in the NHL. So, uh, my wife's looking at me like, you know, you're not going to spend that too much time away from us, but, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, she knows, she knows what makes me tick too. So it's all good. Yeah. It's like, uh, two, you get the call up two weeks. Yeah. Sorry. I, I gotta go home. Uh, the wife yeah. and kids are calling. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll just go well, back go, to Charlotte yeah. for a bit. No, show I'll me the back. paycheck. Show me the paycheck. I'll show it to her. Maybe it'll buy me another two weeks. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> buy your time there. Yeah, that's yeah. good stuff. That that's like yeah. a great philosophy. And like, obviously, we're both young kids and stuff. Still, like, learn and trying to make our way in the in in the game. So, like, actually, like, mm-hmm. it's kind of crazy right now. And like I'm, I'm learning a lot, and I feel like a fan just like listening to these stories. So it's pretty cool. But I want to, I want to keep her going with like one of our newer segments, and the fans love it, and I think it's pretty funny too. So we'll do this or that, and I'll give you two options. You pick which one best suits you. So uh, okay, shoot first or pass first. Oh, a shooter, baby! I, did you see me? I had nine assists, thirty, 30 goals, goals nine, nine assists. assists last year. <laughs> I'm, shooting all, I'm shooting all day. I figured that was going to be the answer. So now, since yeah. you're a shooter, you must uh, you must do these often. But you have to pick one bar down or five hole. Oh, you know what? I I don't think I've ever scored a five hole goal on purpose. Like I don't I don't know how to do it. Like I see these kids wait the goalie out and slip it in. Yeah, and it's like fuck. How the fuck do they do that? Like I'm trying it on like my kids' age goalies, and I still can't. So let's sorry. Long story or long answer would be bar down. Blow it by okay. bar down. There you go. Yeah. That- yeah, I was wondering what you were going to say, and I was going to say, like, are you good at, like, just coming in there and, like, just slipping one in there, like, lightly? No, because dude. that's the like, no. new wave right now. Like, everybody wants to slip them five-hole. I ain't slipping it. I'll tell you that. I'm fucking going up right by your ear. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> buzz, yeah. them, buzz the tower. Yeah. Uh, white, white or black tape? Black. Yeah. Ice cream or milkshake? Milkshake. Beers or wine? Uh, wine gives me a headache, but I love the taste, but I'd probably go with, nah, fuck. I don't know. Beers or wine, Cass? Probably beers. Beers. Yeah. For me. Okay. Yeah. She thought I'd say wine. So I'd say wine. Candy or yeah. chocolate? Uh, chocolate. Not a candy guy. More chocolate for sure. Cardio or weights? <laughs> oh, fuck. This summer it's been cardio cause we got some mean bike tests in, uh, in florida with a new guy but i'd say overall weights okay i appreciate that answer night in or night (laughs) uh that's a tough one i mean you got three kids we like our nights out but we obviously really enjoy uh just putting them to bed um and then watching like a show or something like just feeling like normal humans not being uh you know dictated around all day like 
servants, I guess we could say, uh, to our kids. We love them, but they run our show fucking every day. So we'll go night in. Okay, I can imagine that. But let's reword this question and say Vancouver when you're a young kid, night in or night out? <laughs> night out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, night out. 100%. Uh, yeah. Florida. <laughs> Figured, figured for and sure. My wife there was no way you did. She didn't know me then, too. So she's like, Oh, I, I told her I went out yeah. a lot in Vancouver. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Um, now we can take it into some fan questions here. We got a lot. I had to narrow it down to like a couple, like five or six. But uh, what's the what's your favorite city that you've lived in? Um, I'd say as a young guy, Vancouver, but um, I'd say to, with family, Charlotte. Uh, it's so boring to to like say oh with family, but if you ever have kids, you'll understand. It's just a perfect setup for us. So Vancouver is a young guy, Charlotte is an older guy. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. off the ice, you uh, you've got to hang out with some cool people. So can you talk about like some of those, like any cool musicians or anything you've hung out with uh, off the ice? Yeah, fuck, I don't know. You might have to to get another Zoom uh for this one <laughs> Zoom link, but uh, yeah. So I I like I. I uh, play guitar and sing. I do weddings. I've done bars. Uh, I do it in the summer. Um, I, I don't know if I remember David Booth. He's a hockey player. I played his wife down the aisle. Um, played wow. D- Dale Weiss's wedding. Uh, a couple other buddies' weddings. I I do. I'm that guy at the at the bar that sings his heart out. But um, so rookie year, we got to me and Skins got to hang out with Ed Sheeran. Uh, to keep it a long story short, we uh, we got tickets through his promoter. We show up. He, it's a private show. He's playing on a yacht um he was on the back of the yacht me and skins were watching him and we're with like a bunch of 12 year old girls that won like a radio show uh call in uh but he we knew the manager or somebody knew the manager so they get us down uh at the bottom of the yacht and we meet ed sheeran now me being like the social butterfly that i am i talk his ear off to the point where he's like do you guys want to come to my show tonight and this was before he was famous like he was playing in little venues you know like massey hall type stuff and uh so we go to a show and at the, right before the show, we get a text from his manager that says, Ed Sheeran wants you guys to come backstage, but he has this odd request. We're like, what's the request? We're like, he wants you guys to bring Nerf guns and he wants you to sh- shoot each other with Nerf guns. You know, and like being like a guy that's read rock star books and seen documentaries, I'm like, all right, this is some rock star shit. But like, so me and Jeff Skinner, we go and buy Nerf guns at Target. I'll never forget. We're in fucking Charlotte buying Nerf guns at Target. This is 14 years ago. So we go to his show. It's a small show. He kills it. We go backstage and we have beers with them and we start shooting off Nerf guns. That year, I mean, I could send you a picture. There's a picture of us online of us posing with Nerf guns like we're gangsters, you know, in the hood. <laughs> that we just have these Nerf guns. I need hilarious. this picture. This is that's going in the yeah. <laughs> so there was no context. He just literally wanted to play Nerf after. Yeah, like those those guys are eccentric and and weird to the point where they like he just wanted that's what they want you know like some musicians they want m&ms but they just want red and yellow so you have to sort through that you know and um but i will say so i i this is a crazy story i don't want to be too long but um no I got no to, let's fly we got all i night. got i got to sing uh i will remember you with sarah mclaughlin on stage there's a clip of it on youtube um for context but uh, i was with in vancouver and i did rookie party in nashville and i went up in tootsie on tootsies and i played uh the guitar and sang and a bunch of the guys were there it was rookie party so they knew that i could do it so then this charity event comes around and the sedines come up to me and they said hey we want you to participate in tonight's um like tonight's entertainment and i was like why they're like trust me you're gonna you're gonna want to do it you and a couple of young guys but you're really gonna like it so i start pounding the wine i'm like i'm nervous because i i'm like what are they gonna make me do there's like 1200 people there and i keep seeing this piano on stage and i'm like the fuck's going on here so they bring us up on stage and they give us all mics and then i see sarah mclaughlin and i know sarah mclaughlin i mean everybody does but i like i my mom loved her and she walks behind the stage (laughs) to go to the piano and I go, that's fucking Sarah McLaughlin. It hasn't clued in yet that this potentially could line up with me. Um, she sits down on the piano, everybody cheers. I don't know yet, but I'm, I'm holding a mic. I mean, I knew I was holding a mic, but I don't know that I'm going to be involved. And she hits the first note of, I will remember you. And my heart sank. And then she goes to us, come on over. And, and so I'm like, 
I'm not going to make a joke of this. Like, this is Sarah McLaughlin. I kind of know how to sing. Kind of, you know, I mean, I don't know how to sing like her, but like, I'm going to run with this. So we go over, we start singing with her. And then she goes, now I hear Zach that you can sing, take this part away. And if you watch it, if you watch the clip online, it's hilarious. So I start singing, she's playing. I will remember you for some fucking strange reason. I said, I love you on the mic. I, I meant like, I meant to say like in my head, I meant to say like, I love this or like, fuck, I love you. Like in my head, but I had the mic and I said it and, uh, and everybody heard it. She started laughing. Uh, so I sang the song with her. And then after I have a picture with her, with my hand around her and she signed it to Zach with all my love, Sarah McLaughlin. So I, I got to sing it, you know, I will remember you with her on stage, which was cool. Um, I'm taking that to my grave. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> you sound amazing dude that's legit that's really I good hear stuff say i love her but yeah so it was uh it was uh it was something i just remember racing home Look after those cards that is incredible, man. Hey, you, we got to clip that and throw yeah, it on Yeah, this the is end. good. Oh, dude, I'm going to be editing all week. There's 400 <laughs> clips to post. Sorry, man. <laughs> I told you, you weren't. it's hard to get rid of me. I told you I've, I've lived a little, but uh, so yeah, good. so that, I, mean, I remember racing home, like, you know, Vancouver's three hours behind. So by the time I got out of there, it was like 12 o'clock Vancouver time. It was 3 a.m. at home. I called mom, my mom. I'm like, I'm like out of breath. She's like, I'm like, I'm like, you never heard like, I just fucking saying I will remember you. Sarah McLaughlin. She's like, yeah, right. I'm like, no, turn on the global news tomorrow because I, it kind of blew up because for one, I did okay. And for two, I said, I love you. So the clip like, <laughs> viral on like global. So, and then there's a clip that you can actually, if you're going to clip it, Torch is at a press conference and he goes, I don't, why does Dolp say he loves her? What, what is that? <laughs> like he, he's like rattled about it. They ask him about it in a, in a, press conference that he's rattled about me saying it but um yeah so that was like one of the cooler things i've ever done um yeah i mean it was the fact that i got to you know it's it's on youtube so i'm not bullshitting you but uh it was it was fun for sure that's crazy Holy man crap wow yeah. okay <laughs> let's we'll, let's go a couple more um yeah no worries okay one of them we got who's your wife's favorite player Who's guess they got a question from a fan. Who's your wife's favorite player? I'm guessing it was from Adam Clendenning. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's my wife's favorite player. Uh, I mean, we had this thing in Cleveland where the I, I, I would be the center on the PP and I would draw it back to him on my strong side and he would just walk the middle and he would take a slap shot and he would just aim for the dot and it would be a high tip and it would go under the bar probably six or seven times. Like it went twice in one game. We had this play that, and teams were scouting it and they still knew it. And then I got like a pretty good contract after that. And my wife's like, I love Adam Clendon. He's my favorite <laughs> player. So I took yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's hilarious. Um, so you're a singer. We know what's your go-to karaoke song. Um, not to be too sentimental, but my mom, like, uh, you know, when my mom was around, she, she obviously got me into guitar. She was a, a phenomenal singer and, and a pretty decent guitar player. She loved, uh, the song 3 a.m by matchbox 20 so it's it's like a a pretty cliche like song to play because everybody can play it all these beginner guitar um guys but it's more special to me because uh before she passed she was like hey i i want you to start every gig with that song and, and think of me so that's probably a good uh a good like in remembrance of her to to start i still play it all the time when i'm fiddling around on the guitar so um that's probably my my go-to one yeah, that's that's sweet. That's a good answer. Now we yeah. we have a lot more fan questions, but I know like we've been going for a long time. Yeah, I gotta wrap it up at some point. But yeah, yeah, you can wrap. Yeah, whatever. You I need. Delphs. I mean, I have your number. I'm gonna be texting. I gotta hear some of these things. We gotta talk more. I I loved having you on. Our listeners are gonna love this. Maybe we do a part two, Cardi. Yeah. Oh like, no, really. I, I think we got to, man. Like yeah. this is like this is like because normally like w what we do like we have a lot of young guys, right? Like or right. guys just starting out. Like we don't have guys who have like been through all these crazy NHL coaches or all these like have all these crazy stories. So like I feel like you have a million more that we just I didn't do. Time I, for know. My, I, I have a million cast. Do I have a million stories or what? And I promise, like it's funny too. I I don't put like salt and pepper on them. 
um well like we I, got I don't proof know, just, on youtube and yeah stuff. <laughs> but but like i i feel like i've been like lucky enough to be inserted into these like situations but then with the like the way my personality is like you could drop me in the middle of the desert and i'm gonna make a few friends so like i i'm like a, i'm a social butterfly but i can also like i'm a chameleon too like i can adapt and like anything you know like I'm not saying i'm smart or well-read or anything but i just i i know a, a little bit about some things and i can I can weasel my way into some green rooms and backstages and, and all that. And it's been, uh, I mean, now, now with kids, I don't have time to do any of it, but, um, throughout my career, it's, it's been fun. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm this kid from Paris, Ontario, like and I'm singing, I will remember the Sarah McLaughlin, like no one ever thought I could do shit like that. So <laughs> yeah. it's almost like a challenge now, like, uh, or maybe it was now I'm just this old guy with kids, but it's been fun for sure. I, and I, I don't want to keep talking because I know you guys probably have to go too, but I, I, I like to talk. So, I mean, I will say though, Curtis Gabriel's, I met my match. He's likes to talk a little more than me, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, great guy. But yeah. So whatever you guys need, just let me know for sure. Yeah. yeah. We appreciate it, man. I'll, I'll flip it to you cars to, to wrap it up. But yeah, no, obviously like, that's what I was just saying. Like it felt like, I've never heard stories like that. And it was, it was pretty cool to just kind of like hear them and appreciate them and the sincerity when you're telling these stories and you can tell there's no bullshit and you got, you got videos and story and pictures and stuff to back you got it receipt, up. Receipts, you got receipts, as you guys say. I got receipts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it, you, you know the date of exact thing. So we got to yeah. clip that goal because I'm doing the hop next, the next goal I score in a game, I'm doing the hop for yeah, Dallas. Yeah, do the hop. But uh, no, man, like really appreciate this. Obviously, camp's coming up soon. So best of luck there. Make sure you're staying in Florida and then um, we'll talk soon. Yeah. Like I want, but before you guys let me go, I just uh, like I'm a big, I'm interested in the media side of hockey. So when I started following you guys, I think it was a couple of years ago or however long you've been doing this, fresh off of when you started, like, it's not spitting chiclets that I don't, and I don't think it needs to be like it. Ne people need to hear these young guys stories. They don't need to be a list hockey players, you know, like they need to be how you got there and how these kids are getting there. And so I guess to wrap it up, like I appreciate um, this side of it too. Like it's the name says it all showbound um, because at the end of the day, like these kids, they're, they're, I don't know, they're players too, but they're people and some of them have billets and like you cards, you like, you're drafted and with you, Ras, you're going to hopefully don't have to work with West Consortium, but like you're going through this shit. Right. And it's, um, it's, it's cool to see. And I, I definitely respect it. So I appreciate what you guys do. Wow. I want to thank Zach Dalpe for that one. That was an unbelievable interview. I really hope you guys enjoyed that one as much as we did, but cards, what do you think of that? Yeah. I mean, we hyped it up before the interview, so I really hope it lived up to expectations for everybody there um i know we really enjoyed doing it and yeah thanks to zach obviously he's a busy man he's got to fit those workouts in at 8 30 at night so to cram some time in with us was really awesome and it, it wasn't a short one so i hope you guys enjoyed that and yeah let it let us know like we said before give us some feedback and i mean we don't really have much to say here on the back end just want to like let you guys appreciate those stories and we really hope you got a great laugh out of them yeah exactly what you said i don't really have much either but if you're listening to this this far into the episode like send us a message let us know what you thought also we just appreciate you for sticking around this long and uh yeah i guess uh cards i'll, I'll send it back to you but i do want to say it's been a hot humid couple of days so what do you got for the weather now that now that it's on you instead of jasper weatherby yeah it certainly has been and you know what um i saw the weatherman today like i said earlier so he gave me the weather report for this week as well and he said it, it was rainy and humid in the earlier on this week but uh we're looking like it's it's going to be another hot week here as we end the uh, end of August here. So let's try to enjoy the sun, get outside while we can, because I went to Starbucks today with my girlfriend and they're opening up their uh, fall line of pumpkin spice options. So it's like Manscaped you know, said. Yeah, you know, it's coming fast. So enjoy it while we can and we'll see you guys next time.